morning. So I just wanted to kick off this morning, because uh, in case you can't tell, I'm pretty excited about PyTorch. Um, and we're going to get into the meat of what's new in PyTorch 1.3, and you're going to hear from lots of awesome speakers talking about how they're either improving or using PyTorch. But I just wanted to give you a, a couple of minutes of my thoughts on sort of where we are and where we're going. Now, obviously, PyTorch has grown just ridiculously over the last couple of years. And I've talked to tons of people who are excited about PyTorch, using it today, and, and where it's going. And when I've talked to people around the world about this, I've heard sort of three common themes about why people love PyTorch. And I just wanted to share them with you. And I, and I think they're going to be fairly obvious. You know, the first is, this is a true community. You saw that slide with lots of names scrolling through. We've got people from all over the world contributing and being part of this project. We're nearly at, I had to put a tilde in front of the 1,200, because I think it's 11, uh, 900 and some, uh, about nine short of 1,200 contributors to PyTorch around the world. That's a 50% year-over-year growth. And this means everyone from independent developers to people at Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Uber, CMU, MIT, and many, many more. So I wanted to start this morning with everyone in the room here, everyone watching, just say a warm thank you for all the work you've done to sort of make PyTorch what it is today. Now, the second reason, and, and I think the most common reason probably most of you are using PyTorch, and when I talk to people why they get excited about PyTorch, is because it has been singularly designed for ease of use for the researcher. It's eager mode by default. It uses all the basic Py Python idioms, libraries, tools. Debugging a PyTorch model is sort of easy, just as it is debugging any other Python program. And this makes it not only easy, it makes it fun. And when development is fun, we get a lot more done. And you can see this in how people are using it for research. PyTorch is now one of the most referenced tool chains for research. Its mentions and archive have gone up 194% year over year. Uh, and if you look at top peer-reviewed conferences for ML, this is CVPR, ICCV, ICML, Neural IPS, uh, PyTorch is anywhere from 50 to 70% of the mentions. So it's, I think, fair to say PyTorch is the biggest and fastest growing framework that researchers choose because they love it. And we're seeing this in people learning ML and deep learning and AI for the first time. Tens of thousands of students, people across online sites like Udacity and FastAI, major institutions like Stanford and Harvard and NYU are educating people based on PyTorch. Now, it has been designed for researchers, and I think the thing that will continue to be true is there will be a laser focus on ease of use, simplicity, and good AI, good APIs, excuse me for good AI. But I think what's been new over the last few years is the push for PyTorch into production. Now, I have to tell you, at Facebook, what we saw is just a sort of, just like the rest of the industry, a massive organic adoption of PyTorch. All the research teams basically switched over to it because that's what they loved. And so we ended up in the situation where we had multiple tool chains floating about. We had a lot of Cafe 2 code in production. Uh, we had earlier Torch work. We had earlier cafe work. We had a bunch of custom systems we built. And we sort of had this set of different systems. I'm just going to use the word mess, but um, in, in production and research. And you know, I actually thought for a while that it was OK to have multiple systems, because the needs of production are often very different than the needs of research. You, production, you're worried about reliability, efficiency. And research, you want sort of understandability and iteration speed. And those two things are often tensions that push against each other. What I think I dramatically underestimated was the sort of negative impact this friction of having all these different tool chains had, not just on the production teams, but actually on the researchers as well. And it's obvious as soon as I say it, but when production teams are using a different system, researchers show up with an awesome new benchmark and capability. Production teams are sort of going to not believe it's going to scale or won't work if they convert it over. And this sort of deters research teams from working on stuff that we can get straight into production. And so we took a concerted effort to fix this problem. And over the last two years, there's been a full court push 
to sort of move all of our workflows over to PyTorch. And this means it's now the de facto tool for doing machine learning, deep learning at Facebook, not only in research where it happened organically, but in production. So the vast majority of our models are now trained on PyTorch. And this is true across multiple domains. So think CV, NLP, speech, translation, all these systems are now using PyTorch. And every time we've moved a team and a workflow over from something else to PyTorch, we see faster iteration speeds and just a lot more happiness. Just to give you one very concrete, specific example of PyTorch for a hardware device, we have a product called Portal, which is a video chat device for the home. It's powered by and based on pose detection. So it uses a wide field of view camera and pose detection to figure out where the people are in the room and auto crop and zoom. You can see Portal on the right compared to an iPad on the left. The idea is stick one in the corner, chat with people without having to sort of monkey and play camera person all the time and play with the device. Um, we moved the, or moving the process over to PyTorch and Detectron 2, which we'll talk about in a minute, and it's been a multi-x increase in iteration speed. But the good news is we're not alone. There's lots of companies around the world who've been switching to PyTorch for their production use cases as well. Microsoft has been a key part of the PyTorch community from the very beginning, huge contributor and supporter of it. And Bing, MSR, the Azure teams, including speech services, are using PyTorch to develop ML models and deploy them in production using Onyx. For example, they're using it in language models that scale to billions of words and are now in production for things like Azure Cognitive Services. You're going to hear from Microsoft later today. Tesla is using PyTorch and as one of their tools to train autopilot. It's pretty cool. Uber ATG has been a big contributor to the community as well. They're building joint perceptions and prediction models for self-driving work using TorchScript. They've been a big early adopter of TorchScript and are one of the people helping make sure this community makes sure TorchScript is ready for production use cases like in a vehicle. And this one I had to include just because it's fun and awesome. Mars, the candy company. Everyone here has had an M&M. Did you know your M&Ms are quality controlled thanks to PyTorch? <laughs> so they've actually <laughs> built CV models so that they can act the factory and make sure their stuff is of the quality that consumers expect. And that, to me, is just a great indication of the ease of use of PyTorch, allowing it to be used sort of across the industry. So to me, this is what PyTorch is about, a true community where commits, not dollars, determine your role in the community. We will focus on ease of use for the researcher, and we will make sure that code can find its way to production as fast as possible. But we're here to talk about 1.3, so let's get into the meat. I'm going to give you just a quick preview of the major features, and then we'll go in depth in later talks today. Uh, talking about production, mobile is huge. This is probably the most requested feature for PyTorch 1.3, or PyTorch in general, is the ability to train end-to-end -end and deploy to mobile. Of course, if you're deploying to mobile, performance is very, very important. So there's a lot of work on making this optimized well. And quantization is a key tool for mobile workflows. And so speaking of quantization, quantization is a big part of PyTorch 1.3. In date quantization supported in three different modes. You can do post-training quantization. You can do quantization aware training and dynamic quantization as you go. And of course, if any of you have trained a model, and originally deployed in FP32, you move it over to int 8, you see anywhere from 2 to 4x improvement in performance at inference time, uh, often with a very small, you know, half a percent, 2 percent, possibly absolute loss in, in accuracy. So this is a huge win for mobile. Um, we actually use this all the time on the server, too, because it's worth it to basically be able to run 4x as many inferences with the same hardware. Name tensors. To me, this is a good story on two dimensions. One is, it's why the community works. Sasha Rush, now at Cornell Tech, uh, you know, talked about and proposed name tensors as a better way to work earlier this year. And he worked very closely with the community to build the implementation for PyTorch 1.3. Sort of speaks for itself. If you look at the code here, and you sort of look at A versus B and say, is it better to describe what's happening in comments or to have the code itself document what the different dimensions of the tensor are. And this, to me, is the sort of thing that just makes it easier and faster for people to develop in PyTorch, and pretty awesome. We've got some new libraries in 1.3. Let's start off with Krypton. 
obviously at both Facebook and in the industry, a huge explosion in interest in privacy-aware ML. How do we get the power and the impact of machine learning, but making sure to do everything we can to protect the privacy and security of people's data? So our teams have built a library that allows us to explore all the different secure computing techniques. And this is designed so that if you're an ML practitioner or researcher, you can but not maybe a cryptography expert, you can start to experiment with all the different techniques to understand where the different ones may apply to the specific problem you're working on. This is integrated into PyTorch, uses all the standard libraries, APIs, and sort of idioms there. Explainability is a big challenge I think a lot of us face. This is especially true as models get bigger, more complicated, and more mission critical. And so another release in PyTorch 1.3 is Captum. This is a sort of explainability toolkit that helps you understand, for example, how the outputs um, are relative to inputs or how uh, different neurons are related to inputs. It also has a visualization tool. You can see an example here of obviously categorizing a zebra based on the stripes. And that's the attention of the image that the model is using. We've also got some new frameworks. I mentioned Detectron 2 offhand when talking about uh, Portal, our hardware device. Detectron 2 is, is taking all of the state-of-the-art algorithms out of Facebook AI research and putting them into a library for all of you to use. This is open source now. Um, this makes it easier for you to do amazing stuff. I mean, you can just see the segmentation and object identification happening on the video behind me here. Also, FairSec, which has become a very popular way to do end-to-end um, -end learning for uh, language models, for things like language translation, we're expanding this to also work on speech models. And so you can more quickly iterate and build awesome speech systems. We have a lot of deep dives on all the features of, of Python 1.3 and related libraries today. But it's not just about the code itself. It's also about the ecosystem that is around PyTorch. And this is why I'm so excited. A, a deep collaboration between Salesforce, Google, and Facebook means that PyTorch is now supported in general availability for TPUs training. Single TPUs in GA today, and multi-TPU pods are in early release now. After this, including early support from Microsoft Azure, from AWS, just a few weeks ago, we announced full support from um, Alibaba Cloud. This means that PyTorch is now basically a first-class citizen on every single cloud provider out there. This just means a lot more choices for you to train, deploy your models. The best news is this is all up. It's all on GitHub right now. You can go check out everything I talked about. It's available for you to use, experiment, and most importantly, contribute back to. So thank you again for coming today and for everything you're doing for the community. Uh, I look forward to the in-depth talks today. Thank you all very much.